G'day, my name's Fiona Kamari Campbell. I'm a Professor of Disability and Ableism Studies in the School of Education and Social Work at the University of Dundee. As the world's first professor in Disability and Ableism Studies, I'm really proud that myself and the University of Dundee have an opportunity to be a centre and a place of excellence in undertaking research, having debates and discussions in studies and ableism which is a growing and flourishing field. And I think it's also significant that the first professor in ableism studies is a disabled person from a biracial background. I believe this is really significant in terms of traditional power relations within the academy. And I'm grateful that the University of Dundee has put their trust in me and I look forward to the future. Throughout my life, in fact, as an early child, I've often pondered about the nature of human difference. Why certain groups or individuals suffer? Why is life harder for them? And significantly, what's the origin of hatred and prejudice? These thoughts were shaped by my own experience uh, of being biracial and living the first nine years of my life under the White Australia policy. Then I became severely disabled in 1981 Ironically, that was the International Year of Disabled Persons, which had the theme of breaking down the barriers. After nearly 20 years of working in the community sector and in government, I accidentally fell into academia. And as I say, the rest is history. I've worked in three countries and have been based in different disciplines, community development, social work, sociology and a law school, and now I'm back in social work. Sometimes knowledge formation, that is, establishing new ways of thinking can happen by accident. There's nothing deliberative about my journey into studies and ableism. I was teaching and, and researching in the field of disability studies, which has been around since the 1980s and very much influenced by what is known as the social model of disability. But social theory needs to be constantly updated and it needs to reflect the lives of, of real people um, on the ground. So abstract theory that has any little relationship to uh, the lived experiences of, of people um, is extremely problematic. Good theory is critical for, for social analysis, for guiding change, and indeed acting as an explanatory framework to help us work out what's going on. That's what theory should be about. Bell Hooks once remarked, and I'm paraphrasing here, that for her, theory was a place of healing. Theory helped her make sense of her lived experience. So in 2001, whilst doing my PhD, I inadvertently developed a definition of ableism, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, at the time, I'd been examining narratives of disabled people used by lawyers in the courtroom. I realised that disabled people have been and are a profoundly studied group. In fact, there's actually no shortage on disability, no shortage of research what's all, what at all. Um, there are, of course, are areas that require further investigation, but on the whole, we already know what the situation is and what needs to be done. So the problem is not a lack of research, the problem is a lack of action. So I started thinking about why nothing changes. What is the nature of resistance to disabled people taking up their rightful place in society? Why is it when disabled people seem to have one issue addressed that another issue emerges? It was at this time that I realised, in fact, there was no stable definition of disability. In fact, disability is very hard to pin down. Why is this the case? Well, the notion of a disabled person has changed throughout history. It even changes depending on the context. Uh, it changes even in a single piece of legislation. You might have numerous definitions of disability. And then there's the issue of how do we understand the mind, the body and emotions across different cultures? Who decides who is a disabled person? So when I was thinking about these things, I realised in fact that what, what was not being looked at was the vexed question of what it means to be able-bodied. What does being abled mean? What does ableness mean? What do we mean by the word ability? These are everyday words and concepts. And then we need to understand, well, who are the disabled? The poor, the remnants of society, people we call deviants or castaways. 
Um, and those ideas are very much dependent upon this fluid idea of ableness. They conjure up ideas of fitness, ideas of health, ideas of perfection. Um, and in the workplace, even the very idea of what we understand to be a productive employee, who is a contributory citizen. And I think more significantly then, how does this great fiction of perfection, um, this idea of ableness, keep getting maintained? Why, why do we buy into it? And the fact is very few of us reach the end point that we can truly say we've made it. We are perfected. We have a, a, a dynamic and par excellent body and mind. Most of us actually, um, surprisingly, begin to wonder how do average people, or maybe not so average people, uh, get seduced? How do we get seduced and caught up and enrolled into this quest for perfection? Or at least a desire to arrest what we might see as deficiencies in ourself due to aging, aging or other things like body physique, race and sex. There is then this idea, and it comes in different shapes and forms, this idea of ableness. For example, governments and society might have programs about fitness of populations, uh, groups that are become exemplars of the citizen, uh, groups that are then seen as threats, either because these groups are seen as burdens or they're suspicious or malingerers or deviants, so on, so forth. You get my meaning. So this thinking prompted what has been really a two decade journey into developing a theory of ableism, a new theory of inquiry, and it's known now as studies in ableism. And recently I've been working on also developing research methodologies based on the insights of studies in ableism in order for us to develop strategies, strategies that can intervene in the processes and practices of ableism. So we don't feel kind of uh, despondent that nothing will change. It is possible to intervene. So what is ableism? Now this is an interesting story too. Uh, be careful what you write. That's my first warning to folks. In 2001, in an article when I was a PhD student, I wrote a footnote. Now a footnote is a little comment at the end of a page. And in that footnote, I came up with a definition of ableism. And in the two decades, that footnote basically became the anchor for, for studying and thinking and developing studies in ableism. At that time, I suggested that ableism was a network of beliefs, processes and practices that produce a particular kind of self and body. It becomes a normative standard. In fact, we can say it is species typical. Basically, anyone who doesn't measure up to that standard is cast off as less than human, as disabled or some other nasty category. So, studies in ableism is really a family of ideas that examine what it means to be human and the processes of dehumanisation and the category, how we categorise human differences. In fact, studies in ableism goes beyond a mere concern with disability and looks at other forms of dehumanised difference. So we might look at other forms of human ranking such as caste, race and sex and explore points of similarity and points of difference between different kinds of diminished groups. It's important to say that studies in ableism does not necessarily see common experiences as equivalent. Ableist relations in that sense are quite clever in the forms of stigmatisation and dehumanisation of particular groups through the processes of ranking and prioritising and differentiating between different groups. And we've seen this happen during the time of COVID-19 where different groups have received different priorities. Finally, studies in ableism has been picked up globally, and that's the most exciting bit, by scholars studying immigration issues, issues around caste, parenting, education, even computer studies. So its capacity to engage at multiple levels in different spaces is one of the strengths of this new field of knowledge.